In this video we're going to discuss the completeness of the real numbers, what that means, and an equivalent formulation of the concept. So let's recall some definitions. If f is an ordered field and s is a subset of the field f, then an element l in the field f is a lower bound of the set s if for all s in s l is less than or equal to s. Okay, so that's the definition of a lower bound uh, that we're familiar with. We want to define what it means for something to be a greatest lower bound. Um, basically, it has two conditions. It's a lower bound, and it's the greatest of all lower bounds. So let f be an ordered field, and let s be a subset of the field f. Then v in f is a greatest lower bound of the set s, if the following two conditions hold. First, for all s in s, v is less than or equal to s. So that basically says that v is a lower bound of s. And two, if L is a lower bound of S, then L is less than or equal to V. So in other words, if L is a lower bound, V is, it's no larger than V. So V is the largest of all the lower bounds. That is, it's the greatest lower bound, okay? So lower bound and greatest lower bound are, are of course, very closely related concepts. Greatest lower bound just adds a condition to the definition of a lower bound by saying it's the largest of the lower bounds. Um, a related definition is a definition of a minimum. So if f is an ordered field and s is a subset of f, then an element m in f is a minimum of the set s if m is in the set s and for all little s in the set big S, l is less than or equal to s. So the definition of minimum is similar to the definition of greatest lower bound in the sense that we add a condition to being a lower bound. So definition of a minimum adds a condition to the definition of lower bound. The condition it adds is that the minimum is in the set. We don't require the greatest lower bound to be in the set. Okay, so we add a different condi condition. So we want to make sure that we are clear about the distinctions between a lower bound, a minimum, and a greatest lower bound. And to that end, let's look at some examples. So let's consider the set of all rational numbers R. Uh, so that 2 is less than r. So it's all the rational numbers larger than 2. Okay, well notice that the number 2 and every rational number less than 2 is a lower bound of the set A. Okay, that's pretty clear that if you are less than or equal to 2, um, then you're less than or equal to everything in the set A. And so you're a lower bound of the set A. But notice that 2 is not the minimum of the set A, since 2 is not a member of the set A. So to be a minimum, you have to be a lower bound, and you have to be in the set. 2 is a lower bound, but it's not in the set, so it's not a minimum. On the other hand, every lower bound of A is less than or equal to 2. So 2 is the greatest lower bound of A. Okay, so for this set A, um, it has many, many lower bounds. It has, in fact, no minimum by the average theorem. We can show that this set has no minimum. In particular, 2 is not a minimum of the set, but 2 is the greatest lower bound of the set A. Let's look at the set B. Okay, So B is a set of all rationals uh, so that 2 is less than or equal to R. It's a set of all rationals R so that 2 is less than or equal to R. Okay. So this is all the rationals greater than or equal to 2. Now here, of course, 2 in every rational number less than 2 is a lower bound of B, similar to A in that respect. But 2 is in the set B, so it actually is also the minimum of B. And of course, since every lower bound of B is less than or equal to 2, uh, 2 is the greatest lower bound of B. Okay, So the greatest lower bound uh, may be the minimum of the set, as in this case with set B, um, but it may not be the minimum, as we saw with set A. Okay, um, a minimum of a set, if it exists, will be the greatest lower bound. Um, but a set does not have to have a greatest, does not have to have a minimum, in order to have a greatest lower bound. So let's look at a couple of examples in the integers. So in the integers, if we look at the set C of all integers R, 
that are greater than or equal to 2, okay? Um, well, here, 2 is clearly the minimum and the greatest lower bound of C. But contrast that with the set D. Uh, so D is the set of all integers strictly larger than 2. Um, by discreteness, 3 would be the minimum of this set. And it would also be the greatest lower bound. So whenever the minimum of a set exists, it's going to be the same as the greatest lower bound. But the greatest lower bound can exist when the minimum doesn't, as we saw earlier. OK, so let's look at a couple more complicated examples. So let's look at these sets E and F. So E and F both consist of positive rational numbers. So both of the sets take elements from the rationals. They have R and Q. And both of the sets require that 0 be less than R. So we're looking only at positive rationals. In the case of the set E, we want to look at all the positive rationals whose square is larger than 2. And in the set F, we want to look at all the positive rationals whose square is greater than or equal to 2. Now, if you think about this a little bit, like what rationals are in the sets E and F and what rationals are not in the sets E and F, you would notice that, for example, uh, 2 is in the set E and in the set F because 2 squared is bigger than 2. Uh, 1.5 is in there uh, because 1.5 squared is 2.25. So that gets you in both the set E and the set F. On the other hand, 1.4, uh, the square of 1.4 is 1.96. So 1.4 would not be in the sets E and F. Um, so you can see that the sets E and F contain numbers um, probably be slightly below 1.5, but they have to be larger than 1.4. Uh, in fact, if you were to play that game a little longer and think a little harder about it, you would find that both of these sets have the square root of 2 as the greatest lower bounds. Okay. But that's sort of an interesting case because um, root 2 we know is not a rational number, um, but it is the greatest lower bound of these sets E and F. So we want to focus on this property of the rational numbers, Okay, that evidently not all sets of rational numbers have greatest lower bounds which are also rational numbers. Okay, If a set has a minimum, um, that set has to contain the minimum. So if a set has a minimum, if a set of rationals has a minimum, it's a rational number. But here we can see that if a set of rationals has a greatest lower bound, it doesn't have to be a rational number. All right. So in some sense, the rationals are incomplete, in, incomplete in the sense that they don't contain all the numbers that they might contain. We want to fix that with what's called the completeness axiom. So we want to add a bunch of numbers to an ordered field by asserting that the ordered field is complete. So by completeness, we mean the following. We say an ordered field F is complete when the following holds. If you have a set of numbers from the field that has at least one element and at least one lower bound, then there is some element of the field, some element S of the field, that is a greatest lower bound of the set S. Okay. So in other words, non-empty subsets of the field which are bounded below have a greatest lower bound in the field. So that's the completeness axiom. So this property, this is not a property of a standard ordered field. It's another uh, axiom or or another requirement we would could make, and we would form a new class of ordered fields. Um, but it turns out that there's only one complete ordered field, and it's the real numbers. So we state that here as a definition, um, but it's also something that could be proven that any two complete ordered fields are, are the same in some precise sense. And so we say there's only one complete ordered field, and that complete ordered field is the real numbers. Okay. So that makes it special, and contrasts it. There are a bunch of fields, a bunch of ordered fields, in mathematics, um, but there's only one complete ordered field, and that's the real numbers. Now there's another way to formulate the completeness axiom. We formulated it in terms of greatest lower bounds, but there's nothing really special about greatest lower bounds. We could have made all of this in terms of least upper bounds. So um, we have this alternate completeness axiom. 
that if s is a set of numbers from r, and s has at least one element, and s has at least one upper bound, then there's some element of the field uh, that is an upper bound for the set s. Okay, So the alternate completeness axiom says that non-empty sets which are bounded above have at least upper bound. The completeness axiom says that non-empty sets that are bounded below have uh, a greatest lower bound in the field. Alternate completeness axiom, non-empty sets which are bounded above have a least upper bound in the field. Okay, So we want to prove that um, we state this as a theorem because we want to prove that, that the alternate completeness axiom is true of, ordered, of complete ordered fields. So if we know a field is complete, that is if we know that in a field non-empty sets which are bounded below have greatest lower bounds, then we want to prove that non-empty sets which are bounded above have least upper bounds. Okay? So we state this as a theorem and we'd like to prove that if field is complete it satisfies this. Okay, so to do that, let's begin the proof by supposing that we have a complete ordered field, which we'll call R because it's the unique ordered field, and suppose that S is a set of real numbers. Okay. Let's suppose that S has at least one element and at least one upper bound. So we want to prove that it has at least upper bound. Now let's define uh, the set UB of S to be the set of all upper bounds of the set S. So it's a set of all real numbers which are upper bounds of the set S. What's important here uh, is the following. We claim that if we have an element of the set S, then S is a lower bound of the set of upper bounds of S. Okay. If we have an element of S, then that element of S is a lower bound of the set of upper bounds of S. So it sounds a little bit confusing, but the proof is actually fairly straightforward. So if we have an element of S, what we need to prove is that it's less than or equal to any given element of the set UB of S. So let's assume that U is an element of the set UB of S. Of course, the set UB of S consists of upper bounds of the set S. Okay. So if we want to prove that S is less than or equal to U, well, we know S is less than or equal to U because U B of S is a set of upper bounds of S. So if U is in that set, U is an upper bound of S. So S is less than or equal to U. Okay. So we prove that given any element of S, it's less than or equal to any element of U B of S. In other words, if S is an element of the set S, then it's a lower bound of the set UB of S. So that completes the proof of the lemma. So because S has at least one upper bound, that was one of our hypotheses, UB of S has at least one element. And S has at least one element. So that tells us that since S elements of S are lower bounds of UB of S, and S has at least one element, we know that UB of S has at least one lower bound. So the set of upper bounds of S is not empty, it has at least one element, and it has at least one lower bound. See what we're trying to do here is set up this set UB of S so we can apply completeness to it. Okay, so by the completeness axiom, which was one of the hypotheses of the theorem that we're proving here, uh, UBS has to have a greatest lower bound in R. Let's call it T. Okay, so by completeness, UB of S has a greatest lower bound. Let's call it T. And we're going to claim, uh, we want to claim that T is the element we want. T is the least upper bound of R. Okay, since it's a greatest lower bound, let's just enumerate its properties first. Um, it's a greatest lower bound, so it's a lower bound of UB of S. T is a lower bound of the set of upper bounds of S. And if V happens to be another lower bound of UB of S, then V is less than or equal to T. Okay, So T is the greatest lower bound of UB of S, so it's a lower bound and it's the largest of the lower bounds. Okay, So we claim that T is a least upper bound of S. 
So to establish this, we have to prove, first of all, that it is an upper bound. Okay, so we want to show that if x is some element of s, then x is less than or equal to t. So that would make t an upper bound of the set s. And we want to prove that if u is another upper bound of s, uh, then t is less than or equal to u. So first we'll prove that if x is an element of the set s, then x is less than or equal to t. So let's assume that x is an element of the set s. Um, since x is an element of the set s, x is a lower bound of the set ub of s. But we know that x is less than or equal to t because t is the greatest lower bound. Okay, so by being in s, that makes x a lower bound of the set ub of s. That was proved in our earlier lemma. But what is t? t is the greatest lower bound of ub of s. So we have to have that x is less than or equal to t. Okay, so now we're going to prove that if u is an upper bound of the set s, then t is less than or equal to u. So we're going to prove that t is the least upper bound. So assume u is any upper bound of s. Then of course u is in ub of s. u is in the set of all upper bounds of s. Um, so that means t is less than or equal to u because remember that t is a lower bound. It's the greatest lower bound of u, b of s. t is a lower bound, so t is less than or equal to u because u is in u, b of s. Thus t is an upper bound of s, and if u is an upper bound of s, then t is less than or equal to u. So those two properties together tell us that t is a least upper bound of the set s. So that completes the proof of the alternate version of completeness. Uh, from the completeness axiom. Thanks for listening.